Welcome to Auto Mundial, the weekly car news and review show. This time we're taking a look at a stylish new saloon car from Genesis, the G80. It certainly looks good, but is it impressive enough to take on the best from Europe? And for those that prefer the roar of a V8, Merck's 800 horsepower super saloon and the outrageous Ford F-150 Raptor R. That's all coming up, but first, the news. The Volkswagen Group has announced that its chairman, Herbert Dice, is stepping down. This move could represent the start of a new era for Volkswagen, with Dice having seen the group through labor union disputes, job cuts, and of course the Dieselgate scandal of 2015. He is credited though with VW's push towards electrification and according to a Volkswagen Group statement, plenty of innovative product ideas. He is to be replaced by the current boss of Porsche, Oliver Bloom, who will retain his position at Porsche. British buyers may not have heard of Genesis, but elsewhere in the world, Hyundai's luxury sub-brand has garnered a solid reputation for slightly more affordable alternatives to the more obvious choices. But if Hyundai wants to conquer the European competition on its own turf, it'll need to bring its A-game, especially in the impenetrable executive saloon class, dominated by the likes of Mercedes, BMW and Jaguar. This is the G80, a big four-door going up against XFs and E-classes in its own unique style. See this rolling into the business center car park and there'll be no mistaking it for anything else. With its split headlights, chrome mesh grille and lavish bewinged bonnet emblem, the Genesis stands out. The long bonnet and coupe-like silhouette add some extra sophistication too, but it's on the inside where the G80 really impresses. Step inside and you're cocooned in a leather-lined cabin that's every bit as classy as its formidable rivals. The wood is real and there is an abundance of leather if you step up from the plethora upholstery in the base spec model. Genesis has been careful to ensure the fit and finish are up to scratch too, while the widescreen infotainment system looks every bit as slick as you would expect in this class. But while it might match the Europeans with its cabin, the engine selection is less impressive. There is, at present, just one option, a 2.5-litre four-cylinder engine producing 300 brake horsepower, powering either the rear wheels or all four. Performance is decent, hitting 62 from rest in 6 seconds onto a top speed of 155. Its fuel consumption isn't quite so impressive, achieving a shade over 31 miles per gallon combined. There is, however, an electric version called the G80 Electrified. The 323 mile range is impressive and it'll do the 0-62 sprint in under 5 seconds thanks to its two electric motors. However, Genesis isn't the only left-field option in this rather staid part of the market. This is the Lexus ES, a car we like rather a lot. Fresh from a midlife overhaul, the ES doesn't look all that different than before with just a new grille and narrower headlights marking it out. The engineers instead concentrated on the chassis to make the new ES more comfortable and better to drive. It gets some updated suspension which Lexus says has made the car more predictable, especially at high speed. The ES was always a relaxing car to drive, but Lexus has tried to refine it even further with incredible attention to detail. For example, 
the electronic braking system has been recalibrated and the brake pedal itself is now slightly bigger with more bracing around its mount to reduce vibrations to your foot. The door mirrors on top spec Takumi cars have been replaced with cameras as we've seen on numerous EVs. Sadly, the integration here isn't the slickest, with the pictures being fed to a pair of rather incongruous screens mounted on the A-pillars. Like the Genesis, the ES gets just one engine option, a 2.5-litre four-cylinder petrol motor hooked up to an electric motor and battery pack for a combined 215 brake horsepower. Sadly then, it lacks the broad range of engine choices you get in its German rivals, and it's also somewhat lacking in performance. 0-62 takes a casual 8.9 seconds onto a very modest top speed of 112 miles per hour. It is economical though, returning up to 54 miles per gallon. As likeable as both the Lexus and the Genesis are then, it still feels like the Jaguars, BMWs and Audis of this world offer more complete packages. We're glad though to see so many interesting saloon cars on offer, despite the popularity of SUVs. The Skoda Kodiak has always been a likeable car. It's a practical, fuss-free, affordable family bus with just enough creature comforts to keep it competitive against its VW Group stablemates, the Tiguan Allspace and the Seat Turaco. And now Skoda has given its seven-seat SUV a midlife facelift. It's nothing drastic, just a bit of nip and tuck, but it does look smarter than the old one with an updated grille, new headlights and a redesigned bonnet. At the back, the changes are similarly effective with a new spoiler and fresh taillights really marking it apart from the old car. And it isn't just the aesthetics that have been upgraded. Under the bonnet, the Kodiak now gets a new range of engines. There are two diesel options to choose from, both 2 litres in capacity with either 148 or 197 brake horsepower. They both come with Skoda's new twin dosing system which reduces the number of harmful emissions coming from the exhaust. The petrol lineup consists of a 148 horsepower 1.5, a 187 horsepower 2 litre and the sporty top of the range VRS model gets a 242 brake horsepower turbocharged 2 litre. Most buyers though will be looking at one of the lower trim levels. The range kicks off with the £33,000 SE drive model with either 5 or 7 seats. Better equipped SEL Sportline and LK models all come with a third row of seats as standard. Step up to the VRS though and you'll be forking out more than 46 grand. Step inside and you're greeted by a pleasantly finished, well-built interior. SE cars are a little basic, but step up to the sport line and you'll find most of the kit that you'll likely want. If you want some real luxury though, the LK model is the one to go for. It comes with ventilated electric leather seats, a 360 degree camera and a digital instrument display. So what else is on offer for those after a seven seat SUV? This is the latest Hyundai Santa Fe. It's big, bold and sure to turn a few heads. A facelift of the previous generation, this new car is certainly a head turner. We've been pretty vocal about our opinions of other manufacturers' big grills in the past, but this time we have to say we rather like it. After all, this is a big car and the most expensive combustion-powered Hyundai you can buy here in Europe, with prices starting at over £41,000. That may seem pricey compared to entry-level Kodiaks, but it is on par with the higher-spec versions. 
It's roomy inside and, like the Skoda, has even seating for seven. If that price is putting you off though, the Skoda's Spanish stablemate is worth considering. The Seat Taraco starts at under £32,000 and is available with a wide range of trim levels. It comes with the same range of engines as the Skoda, minus the powerful VRS motor. They're very similar on paper then, but the Seat does offer a bit more style. It's a good-looking car with a slightly more premium image than the Skoda. On balance, however, it seems to us that it's Skoda who's got it just right. It's slightly cheaper and with a more diverse selection of trim levels, thanks to the luxurious L&K and the sporty VRS. If it's a VW Group 7 seater you're after, a Kodiak is your best bet. After the break, a 700 horsepower pickup truck and an 800 horsepower saloon. Coming up, Ford's F-150 Raptor turned up to 11. First though, The Jeep Compass has had a mid-life facelift for 2022. Well, we say facelift, but from the outside at least, nothing much seems to have changed. Jeep reckons that Compass customers love the looks of the old car, so if it ain't broke, don't fix it. They have made one or two cosmetic changes though. The lower grille is wider and the bumper looks ever so slightly more aggressive while LED headlights are now standard across the range. The interior has had a much more thorough update with a completely new dashboard design. It looks much more premium with its new 10.1 inch touchscreen infotainment system and a swanky digital dash display. Jeep wants the Compass to take on the likes of Hyundai Tucson and Skoda Karoq, so it's up the interior quality to compete. The biggest change, though, comes with the introduction of a new plug-in hybrid system. Called 4xE, a name we've previously seen on the hybrid Wrangler, it pairs an electric motor to the Jeep's 1.3-litre turbocharged petrol engine. Total power is an impressive 237 bhp, getting the compass from 0 to 62 in 7.5 seconds. Not bad, but not exactly rapid either. It's plenty quick enough in this class though, and the 30 mile electric only range will be plenty for most commutes and school runs. The electric motor is also useful off-road, where the Jeep's new EAWD system allows for greater control on loose surfaces. The headline stat though is the fuel economy, 157 miles per gallon. What's more, the 11.4 kilowatt hour battery can be fully charged from a seven kilowatt wall box in under three hours. The new Compass then may look the same on the outside, but this is a thoroughly updated car. It's packed full of new tech, especially the top spec S model, and the new hybrid powertrain means this will be one of the cheapest cars in its class to run. The Jeep Compass isn't an obvious choice, but it is one that is well worth considering. It's fair to say that there's no shortage of big, powerful AMG saloons these days. The E63 is still the go-to super saloon while stocks last, and the latest CLS is one of the prettiest cars in the Mercedes range. And then there's this, the AMG GT four-door. More expensive than the other two and not as nice to look at, it's always, rather understandably, been quite a rare sight on the roads. 
Now though, a falter back is looking to change that with a comprehensive update. There have been some minor updates to the six-cylinder car, but the flagship V8 has had a thorough reworking. At first glance though, not a great deal seems to have changed. It still looks pretty much the same as it always has, bar some updated badges and externally fluted exhaust pipes. Even the engine is the same, AMG's famous turbocharged 4-litre V8 producing 630 horsepower. However, look closely and you'll spot a few worrying details. There's a badge on the side that says E-Performance, and there's some sort of flap on the rear bumper that looks as if it could be hiding a charging point. Could it be? Has AMG made a hybrid? The answer is yes. The Mercedes AMG GT 63 SE Performance, to give it its full title, is a plug-in hybrid. The small 6.1 kilowatt hour battery is quick to charge and can provide up to seven and a half miles of electric only driving. It also means that the big thirsty V8 Merc can now achieve more than 32 miles per gallon. But this new e-performance version of the GT four-door isn't really about fuel economy. You see, the electric motor has another benefit. At full power, it produces an extra 201 brake horsepower, meaning you get a combined total of 831. As a result, this big saloon car can do 0 to 62 in 2.9 seconds, topping out at just shy of 200 miles per hour. What we have here then is a fast, green, practical four-door family car that just happens to be the most powerful road-going Mercedes ever made. Believe it or not though, the AMG is not alone in the class. Enter the Porsche Panamera Turbo SE Hybrid. Like the Merc, it has a snappy name and a plug-in hybrid system. It also uses a turbocharged 4-litre V8, but this time it's hooked up to a bigger battery. As a result, the Panamera can drive much further on electric power, up to 31 miles, while economy is up massively to 97 mpg. However, it can't match the Merc on power. 690 brake horsepower is impressive though, and it will hit 62 miles per hour from rest in 3.2 seconds, providing you spec the optional Sport Chrono Pack. It isn't the best looking car in the world, but neither is the Merc, and there is an estate version available called the Sport Turismo. Inside though, you're in for a real treat. The Panamera has a fantastic cabin. It's well trimmed and spacious, not to mention more tasteful than the shiny carbon clad cockpit of the Mercedes. If you're a fan of the V8 Super Saloon formula, but don't want the PHEV setup, both of these cars are available without them. They're not quite as quick, but they are lighter. For the ultimate in four door speed though, a plug-in hybrid is what you need. The Ford F-150 Raptor is an outrageous vehicle. With its big V6 specialist off-road suspension and wide stance, it's a truck like almost nothing else on or off the road. We say almost because now Ford has gone even further with this, the totally wild Raptor R. Ford describes it as the fastest, most powerful, most extreme high-performance off-road desert Raptor yet. So how have they done it? Well, for starters, gone is the 3.5-litre V6. In its place sits a magnificent supercharged 5.2-litre V8, the same one you get in the Shelby GT500. 
It produces a whopping 700 horsepower and 640 pounds-feet of torque. Every inch of the engine has been breathed on by Ford Performance engineers, with everything from the air filter to the oil pan receiving some attention. The gearbox has been beefed up and recalibrated to handle the punishment of bumps and jumps, while the chassis is now even more impressive with 24-inch springs and Fox shocks that have been specially tuned for the R. In fact, just about everything has been strengthened, lightened, reinforced or retuned to make this better than the regular R. Ford has yet to reveal its performance stats, but with an extra 250 horsepower versus the standard Raptor, we'd say it'll be pretty quick indeed. Join us again next week on Auto Mundial as we check out BMW's new iX1.